morning and welcome to a chilly Juma Private Game Reserve. My name is Brent Deer Smith. I have Jandre Gerding on camera. We have Jamie and Dangerous Dave out on the other vehicle. And we have Rebecca, Louise, and I think also Geraldine in final control today. So a full, full suite of ladies there. And look at this. And we've got mist in the valleys. It's the second coldest day we've had so far. Isn't that absolutely gorgeous? Jean-Dre has already given me a lecture saying, please stay away from the valleys till it's warmer. Uh, for multiple reasons, so we don't freeze. And also, so the camera does not mist up. But unfortunately for Jean-Dre, that's where the cats like to stay. So we might have a little bit of misting on the lens, but it'll be worth it if we've got one of Africa's gorgeous big cats to put on camera. So we're going to be heading down towards the south, looking for the elusive Queen of Juma, uh, Karula. For those of you not sure, Queen Karula is the dominant female leopard in this area. And fingers crossed, we're going to be able to find her. She gave us a monster of a run around yesterday. Spotted, not spotted, no tracks, some tracks, ground hornbills disappearing, but no sign of her in person. And uh, I think Aaron on the Sunset Safari last night said, we never find Krula. Krula lets us see her. So hopefully Krula will let us see her this morning. So let's get going. I love these cold mornings because it means the cats are on the move. So let's see if we can find one of them. Of course, I have misplaced one mitt. And we are at Injuma Private Game Reserve. Oh, sorry, the northeastern part of South Africa. We're part of the Greater Kruger National Park and on a bigger scale part of the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park. 13 million acres of unfenced wilderness all set aside for the use of the wild beasties. Now, I have misplaced my... There we go, I found it. So, if you're new, I don't like the cold. If you're old, you know I don't like the cold. So I'm going to button up the hatches, mitts, scarves, beanies, the works. There we go. And because it's still dark, we're going to use a spotlight. And as I said, if you are new to Safari Live, uh, we only use the spotlight to look at the nocturnal animals your diurnal animals, such as most of your herbivores, zebra, giraffe, and impala, we don't shine the spotlight on. Oh, what tracks do we have here? It's Howard the hyena. And so therefore, we are not going to try to follow those. Hyenas walk everywhere. And your average hyena does about 20 kilometers, which is about, I think, 11 or 12 miles a night. Right. We don't look for them. We go check for them at the den. And I think Jamie is heading towards that area this morning. She's got a flat tire. So she's going to be a little late on this sunrise safari. I love the fact we call it the sunrise safari. And the sun has not even shown its pretty self on the eastern horizon. So, on yesterday's sunrise for Jandra and I were lucky enough to see a honey badger and see it disappear down a hole. And James Richard, good morning James, I hope you are splendid. Well, I suppose it's not morning, it's middle of the night for you. Uh, is wondering if we can go check the possible honey badger den. Uh, we actually had a, quite a discussion about that around the, the dinner table last night, James. And, and we're all in agreement that I don't think it's a den. I think the honey badger went down there to sleep for a little bit and would have carried on. Due to the food so shortage created by the drought, I think it was a, a nap over spot rather than a den. But we will have a look, but I think it's a, a pushing our luck a little to assume the honey badger is going to be there. But we are definitely looking for Queen Karula. And uh, if we have no luck here, we'll go have a quick squiz on the eastern boundary 
at the hole, the honey badger disappeared in two. So this pre-dawn period is for me one of the most exciting because it's that time of the morning when the big cats like to make a bit of noise. So we're not only listening for alarm calls, we're actually listening for the vocalizations of the big cats. And of course, we all know what a lion sounds like. But I think this morning we're listening for the slightly less sexy in terms of calling, but definitely more sexy in terms of visuals. Leopard, who sounds something like this. The best way I've heard it described is like someone sawing wood. And if you're not used to the bush, that is what you hear. It sounds like someone sitting with a big bow saw and cutting through a large tree. We are going to stop shortly to listen to what's going on. At the moment, all I can hear is a crested Franklin shouting. Oh, hello. Do we have any tracks here? Just the hyena track still. So the last place Kula seen was about there. Her general direction was towards this road here, which is called Shabam. And we're going to go have a look. And hopefully she's had some luck overnight. And if she's managed to make a kill, it means she's going to go back, fetch those beautiful little babies, and come visit us for an extended period. If she hasn't, the likelihood is she's going to cross back to the south and back to where she's keeping the cubs. Oh, good morning. Hey, some elephants. Now, giving us a perfect opportunity to listen to what's going on in the bush. Sounds like there's quite a big breeding herd around us. Oh dear, seems like I've had a technical malfunction already. And my earpieces decided to come unglued. There we go, all fixed. So we're not gonna push on too much through a breeding herd and I'm not gonna shine my spotlight on them. Uh, elephants sometimes can get a little bit annoyed with light. But as you can see, we watch her, be, uh, her behavior, wagging tail, showing no signs of discomfort with our presence. But I'm still not going to go flash the big spotlight around. Oh, we can hear a tree expiring somewhere to the right. jean I don't know if you're picking that up on the top mic, but there's also ground hornbill calling. I think it's a bit quiet. Actually calling behind us and in front of us. Do, 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 do. A very common sound before sunrise in the morning. It's when ground hornbills call and they're very territorial, but it's the best time for them to call because in the still early morning, the sound travels about double the distance it would during the day. And look at that, even an elephant of that size is capable of pushing down a tree bigger than me. So that elephant's probably about three or four years old. Now Edmund is starting us off on quite the question and Edmund is getting my grey matter going really early this morning. Edmund is wanting to know what is the smallest mammalian species in the Greater Kruger National Park and 
mammalian, or so mammalian, mammal, warm blooded, but he also wants to know the carnivore and herbivore. So, the smallest member of the order carnivora that occurs in the national park. Oh, John Ray's seen something. Oh, it's a little baby Ellie. And while I continue answering Edwin Hunt's question, that is not the smallest baby in the national park. And even an elephant baby at birth weighs about 100 kilograms, which is about 220 pounds. But the smallest mammal in the order carnivora is the dwarf mongoose. And they weigh about 12 grams, which is a lot less than a baby elephant at birth. Uh, but this, I think the smallest mammal in the Greater Kruger National Park is a very sweet little creature. And it's got one of the best names of all animals. It's called a tiny fat mouse. So it's tiny, but it's fat. Very, very cute. Unfortunately, they don't occur on Juma. They occur further to the north. Uh, in the Mapani belt. So we don't get any tiny fat mouse here, but they do occur uh, probably about 30 or 40 kilometers to the north of us. And they are about half the size of my thumb. They weigh almost nothing, about two grams. Oh, look at that. Elephant kisses. So you can just see the tusks appearing on the one on the left, which means it's just over a year old. And little tusks are called tushes. Hello, madam. So we've got an adult female on the road in front of us, joined by another. And she's being annoyed by a young bull. He's probably ar around 20, I would guess. Hello, mister. Oh, jean to the left. The little guys are still playing. Let's just wait for, oh no. There we go, look at that. Sweetest little creatures. It's not often we, we watch elephants in the early morning light. And of course, watching elephants all depends on the individual herd and how they react to us. As you can see, this herd is taking absolutely no notice of us. And if we look at their legs, you can see they're quite a bit darker. So they've been for a drink somewhere. So they've been wet in the last while and look, little guys coming in for a drink on the other side of the female unfortunately these elephants are giving us an incredible sighting they're also letting us keep still and quiet before the sun pops over the eastern horizon so we are listening for any sign of lion or leopard at the same time is enjoying these wonderful pachyderms. Now you can see very clearly the very angled shape of the head, which is diagnostic of a female. The bulls have a much rounder shaped head. Hungry lady. You also see she's very much left tusked. So you can always tell which is the elephant's predominant tusk that they use for feeding by the one that's worn down. And she actually, she's ambi tusked, if we look carefully there. And you can see she's got wear on both tusks, but obviously the left tusk much shorter and broken. But what we see on the right tusk, and you can see that little dip and notch, it almost looks like someone's taken a file and made a little hole there. That's what you call a grass notch. So on the right tusk, that little indentation on the tusk is made from stripping grass. And of course, 
to create something like that in a surface as hard as ivory. You can imagine how much grass she must have had to pull over that tusk to create that indentation. The moment she's eating a little monkey orange tree, which is, as elephants go, not first choice food, but because of the drought, we're going to see them eating quite a few different tree species that they wouldn't eat as a first choice, which is very good because often these tree species don't get fed on. So they'll be broken, pushed, and, and maneuvered around by the elephants during the drought, which will also give the grass and other tree species a chance to grow because monkey oranges quite often can take over an area. Oh, what's happening at the back there? The little baby lying down and being stood over by two other juveniles. This looks like quite the game. You can see no little tushes or tusks poking out. And that leads us to believe that that one is probably just under a year or very close to a year. Whereas the little one on the ground is probably about three or four months old. And we are incredibly spoiled to spend as much time as we do with elephants. They do have an incredibly calming way with me, who's a hyperactive as a wild dog. But when I'm with them, elephants, I'm just a little bit more calm than normal. And you can see how that left tusk is broken. So fortunately for her, it is broken above the lip line and, and, and not in. So I don't think she's in any pain from that that break. Oh, that one's having a dust bath in the background. So there's various different reasons why elephants dust bath and in this very cold morning it's unlikely to be to keep cool. So they do use dust as a method to try help with any itches or whatnot caused by biting insects, in particular ticks. They'll throw dust upon and then find a spot to scratch. Normally elephants dust, dust bath for the cool, uh, but I don't think they need to keep cool in this cold morning. And a very big and warm safari live welcome to John. And John would like to know how many babies will an elephant have in its lifetime? Well, generally, John, if she doesn't lose any of her calves, depending on the individual, the most they'll ever have is about six, but normally we can say about five. I think I've heard of one female elephant that was studied who had seven. And, and there we go. You can see this, this individual who's... Oh, there's a little one playing behind. You can just see that. Oh, let's move forward a little bit. Let's see what's going on there. Now, very important when you're near elephants is when you start the vehicle, you always let it run for a few seconds. So quite often if you rev, it can be construed as aggressive behavior. You always let the vehicle run for a few seconds. Make sure you're in low range. And this is for our viewers who ever come visiting the Kruger and driving themselves around. And keep your movements slow and steady. And that will ensure the elephants don't get upset with you and you get the best sighting possible. <laughs> to you too, mister. Oh, here we go. Definitely a little boy. Yes, you're very scary, you're very big. We're very scared of you. Now this is very typical elephant calf behavior. They're very curious and now these guys are already playful so 
and we're just inspiring a little bit more mischief in them. And you can see the little guy on the left is taking his cues from his biggest, bigger cousins. Oh yes, very scary. We're impressed. Now, if you ever are driving yourself around the Kruger, 90% of the time, the little one's behavior will absolutely have no effect on the adults. But if they become very stressed and you hear very high pitched screaming and the little ones rush not towards the car but away, it's time to move on because the moms will definitely become a little bit annoyed and you don't want to be stuck in that situation. So we're looking at that one, you see how long the little tusks are? From about this age, it becomes very difficult to discern age from tusks. Because some elephants have big tusks, long tusks, others have short tusks and fat tusks. And that one's probably three or four years old at the moment. It's a little female. You can see that sharp indentation. And then the one behind her looks like a little boy. See the head is slightly more round. When they're young, it's a little bit more difficult. <laughs> To, to, to see, but quite often from their behavior you can pick up who's a boy and who's a girl. And those two little ones playing, there we go, those look like little boys just based on their behavior. When they're young it is very difficult to discern from head shape. As they get older it becomes easier and easier. So, hello, a red, red dog. That's a very interesting handle. And red, red dog would like to know, well, we've seen tuskless female elephants. Are there any tuskless males? Well, I saw my first tuskless male on Juma about three days ago. So, very interestingly, it's the only one I've seen. I'd guess he's about 30-odd. Very big-bodied male, but no tusks. And that's probably from genetics. But it, it is unusual. It's far more common to have tussless females than tussless males. But I think we're going to leave these eddies as they move slightly off into the thicket. And we're going to go see if we can find some big cats. Bye, Ellies. So just having a quick look for tracks. With that elephant herd being around here, it makes tracking that much more difficult. So while I concentrate on searching for the pitter patter of big cat feet, uh, let's go across to Jamie so she can bid you a good morning. Good morning and welcome to our portion of the Sunrise Safari. Hey guys, Guess what's, guess what's better than one flat tire first thing in the morning? Wait for it. Two flat tires first thing in the morning. <laughs> that was not the way I was planning on starting my day. It wasn't even my flat tire, but that's okay. Um, yes, and then we, we took the spare from Jigger, and the spare from Jigger was flat, but I only worked out just how flat the spare from Jigger was after I had put it onto Wendy and tightened everything, you know, let the jack down, done all those things that one does when changing one's tire. So now my hands hurt. Luckily, all of the gentlemen in our camp are exceptionally gallant, so I was not without help. And Dave stepped in, Dave is on camera with me this morning, and Steph and Brent at one point before he had to go out and start off the sunrise safari. So we've had some interesting time. There you go, there's Brent asking for the different routes of every vehicle that's heading out this morning. We are going to the Hyena Den, that is my plan for this morning. Of course, given the way that the morning has currently gone, that could go in any, any possible direction. I've managed to catch my left hand in the jack about three times. 
I'm out of practice, actually. It's been a long time since I've had a flat tire. We used to, when I first trained to become a safari guide, in our assessment, we had to, if we got a flat tire, we had to change that in under 10 minutes or you failed the assessment. Just because guests don't take terribly kindly to being stranded in the middle of the bush, especially if they're paying a considerable amount of money to visit there. I do remember having to change tires very, very quickly. And then of course, where I used to work, I used to have to fix those tires as well. So you knew that not only were you changing your flat tire, but you were coming back to face the tire, the tire lever to get it off the rim and then some crowbars to pull the tire off the rim and get the tube that sits inside our tires out. Then you've got to patch them, you've got to stick them back in, which is always the trickiest part for some reason. And then you have to go on to replacing them and putting them all back together. Hey, let's see if our hyenas are home this morning. Doesn't look like they're on the southern side of the den. All is quiet there. Let's see if they're around on this side. Oh, oh everything's a bit damp this morning. Beautiful morning. Everything's very dewy and fresh. Beautiful looking. Hello. Yes, they're here. You can, you can rest assured. <laughs> the hyena cubs are wide awake and ready to go. Just like little toddlers. And are always awake first thing in the morning. Is our hyena cubs. One of them picked the most difficult way back into the den. Oh, one's gone back to bed. And to be honest, I was one flat tire away from doing the same thing. Oh, bye bye, guys. <laughs> they were clearly very happy to see us. All gone. Just sit for one moment, just to see if they do come out. Little hyena cubs struggle to resist the draw of something entertaining happening around their den site. They get very, very bored, particularly when their mothers are away and out foraging, or out scavenging, it's probably a more accurate representation of what they're doing at the moment. But little hyena cubs, with all of the learning that they're doing, particularly since they've been at the den for the last, this particular den for the last few weeks, they're going to get particularly bored and they're going to want to go wandering about further afield. I'm hoping, mmm, doesn't look like it though. I was hoping that they might be curious enough to come out and start wandering about. Maybe even come up to the vehicle and say a very good morning to us. Unfortunately for us, <laughs> no such luck. Just while we have a look and see if our hyenas decide to come out, Brent's trying to call me on the Game Drive channel. Let me chat to him quickly. Brent, go ahead. Jamie, up to that phone call on our bus vehicle. Only visual be from the gate. Oh, I don't know if you can have signals there, but that would be very bad for us. Uh, also, that thank you. Um, confirm Western Channel, that's sighted. No, negative. Um, on the Northern Channel, if you go to the gate and you look... That's uh, interesting. North, south, money, you ah. you may get a from there. I see. Okay. Well, we're going to... I'm just having a good sniff of this den site. It is really starting to smell exceptionally pungent. Even more so than normal. It smells like they've brought a piece of the carcass back. So, the update that Brent was giving me there on the Game Drive channel is that the Inkahumas did manage to catch something yesterday. So, 
For those of you who missed the sunset safari or are new to our live safaris, the Nkuhumas are a lion pride of five females at present. That being said, one female is very much preoccupied with raising three brand new cubs. The other is currently occupied mating with a Birmingham boy. I'm trying to work out what is so incredibly pungent here. I can't see anything. But that doesn't mean they haven't brought part of the carcass back. It really is incredibly smelly right now. But yes, so yesterday on the Sunset Safari, there were three Nkuhumas chasing, or they had been chasing buffalo all night. Yesterday afternoon, they were resting and relaxing. But apparently, one of the, or the Nkuhumas managed to catch a buffalo during the course of yesterday evening. But, They've caught it outside of our traverse area. In fact, they've caught it so outside of our traverse area that we're going to have to go and sit at the entrance to the Sabi Sands and see whether or not we can spot them from there. And we'll have to just keep our fingers crossed since our hyenas have gone to bed. We're gonna have to keep our fingers crossed that we will be able to spot them from the gate. Isn't that wonderful news? Because they were looking particularly hungry yesterday. They were looking thin. They were looking in need of a good meal. So I'm very glad that they were successful at some point last night. Let's just stop for one second. There's a bird at the top of our marula tree. Over there. Sam's favorite bird. Oh. That's disappointing. <laughs> yeah, that, well, there you go. I can hear him. However, he has exited the sighting. It's a black-headed oriole. It's one of Sam's... I'll, I'll forever remember Sam as saying that he was the most excited to see a black-headed oriole. And I will never forget his excitement when he did actually manage to see one. I'm not playing ball games with us this morning, though. All right, so, Wendy, do we think we can do this? Dave and I know we can do this. It's just a question of whether or not Wendy can. <laughs> we'll have to keep our fingers crossed. Brent is on his way to Cheetah Plains. And it's still a little bit dark for Steph to be out and about on bushwalk. He might be pushing it a little bit. And don't forget, of course, on that note, about the change in the times of the sunrise safari. We will be shifting half an hour later just, just for our morning safari, just for the sunrise safari. And only on the 1st of June. I am uncertain as to when the 1st of June actually is, but we will be changing times then. <laughs> this is Wednesday. What day is it today? Ah, Tuesday, Wednesday, ah. There you see, it's not just me who gets days confused. There's, there's several members of this camp that gets the days of the week confused. I'm relatively certain today is Saturday. Oh, there we go, doing well. <laughs> oh, <laughs> called up on it already. So we have a question from one of the viewers, which I kind of have to go back to yesterday evening, where I spotted, now to be fair, it was a good 50 meters away, so a good about 150 on feet. Behind a bush, I spotted something and I was convinced it was something incredibly exciting. Possibly a genet, maybe a wild cat, you never know. It might have been a caracal or a serval, or it could have been absolutely anything. It was just movement behind a bush. And um, we spent a considerable period of time there having a look at... <laughs> having a look at what was hiding behind the bushes. Betty Sleep would like to know, if we can't see the Nkuhumas, could I maybe find a daker for you all? 
given that what it turned out to be uh, the cat-eared dacre. A cat-eared dacre is what Betty would like to have, given that what it turned out to be after all of that was a dacre, which, you know, was just one of the things. Good morning, and isn't this a fantastic sight? Viam and myself have just been enjoying the sun rising over quarantine and this mist that all of a sudden descended upon us about 10 or 15 minutes before the sun came up. I'm Stefan Winterboer, and we're with Viam Dornbrach on camera this morning. And isn't that just an absolute delight? You know, it's not often that we get to see sunrises like that through the mist. Really, it only happens in about May, and sometimes a little bit in December and January. But May, categorized by these misty mornings. And it'll soon burn off. We're looking at about another half an hour or so until the mist decides to lift. But can you believe how thick it is around us? We're standing pretty much on top of an open area here, on top of a hill, but you can see how the mist is clogging up the valleys, coming in from the north and flowing down. Now we're not alone here, we're sharing this open area with a male blue or brindled wildebeest. And I think it's going to be a good idea for us to see if we can get a little bit closer to him. Male wildebeest this time of the year are quite territorial. And what this wildebeest will be doing is picking his open area spot and marking it. And that lowing that you're hearing, and I'm, hopefully I can show you him lowing a little bit. He's standing just here. I don't want to get too close because he'll actually run away. But that's a big, big male wildebeest. That's one of the prime bulls as we call him. Weighing easily around the 400 pounds. So a big chap. Different to the East African wildebeest, the one that makes all those migrations in that he's bigger. He's also obviously not in a big herd and he lacks the white beard below his chin. We've got a lot of things happening around us this morning. I must be honest, we've heard lions roaring, we've heard leopard roaring, we've got some elephant breaking branches around us, we've got this beautiful male wildebeest that's been lowing at us, the mist, the sun, it's just been a real awesome morning so far all around. What we've decided to go and do today is walk towards Treehouse Dam. Now, they've been doing some landscaping around Treehouse Dam, just busy making it a little bit better at holding water and I haven't actually seen it just yet and neither is VM and that's what we're going to try and get to today. As usual though <coughs> and as is the case with these bushwalks is we get distracted by nearly everything that happens over here and I have no doubt that today's walk is going to be very similar to that. Getting distracted by all the little small things and trying to show you as much as what we can or as much as what interests us. At least anyway. It's been a bit of a chilly start this morning. It hasn't been the coldest morning that we've had. <clears throat> I think the, the moisture in the air that has caused the mist to condense has actually kept the temperature quite warm. It was probably about 10 degrees when we started this morning, which is around about 40 or the low 50 degrees in, uh, uh, Fahrenheit. The first thing that I'm noticing on this particular road is how the wettish soil is holding the track of this spotted ahina very, very well. It's giving us a chance to actually show you all the diagnostic features of a hyena. So the first and most obvious is the fact that right there we've got claw marks. Those are where the claws dug into the sand and that you can see from that angle. The next one is this chop out of that toe that you can see there. That is a half moon toe, very diagnostic of the ahina. And then this two lobed pad, one lobe, two lobes on the pad. And then the next diagnostic feature, and for me the most 
the, the, the one that has the most relevance, excuse me, I was just biting off that piece of grass, is if you put a piece of grass along the track's direction, just like that, and then what you do is you take another piece of grass and you put it against the angle of those pads, you will see that it makes a very definite angled track. It's definitely not perpendicular, and that is the fifth and final diagnostic feature of a spotted hyena. If it was a cat, it would be perpendicular, like that almost. And there'd be a few other things. But a hyena, definitely like this. And this Sabi Sands, where we are at the moment in the Kruger National Park here in eastern South Africa, this granitic-based soil, coupled with a little bit of water, holds track so well. It's one of the reasons why the local Tsonga people or the shangan speaking people have and are some of the world's best trackers. It's because they've got such wonderful sand to work with. Nevertheless, that hyena track is going away from us. <clears throat> Rail has asked a nice question, and I'm sure it's because we've just been with Jamie at the Ahina Den and watching these Ahina tracks on the floor here. At what age do young male Ahina leave the den? Um, <coughs> excuse me. It's different for every Ahina. The matriarch or the, the alpha female, the one that is in charge of the clan, her male pups will stay with her for sometimes ever. Sometimes male pups don't actually leave the den whatsoever. A large proportion of them do. I'd probably say around about 80 to 90 percent of male hyena actually leave the clan area and they do so at varying ages depending on the hierarchy of their mother. So to answer your question simply from zero to two years is where male hyena will leave a clan. Now what's quite interesting for me and something that I only recently just found out is that male hyena that stay at the clan and are associated to the clan leader or to the alpha female, they get pickings, they get the choice pickings at the carcasses and quite often these male hyena are bigger and more robust and actively take part in actually defending the clan against other clans and other hyenas. Male hyena that leave the clan, they don't get the choices pickings. Quite often, these poor hyena are the last to actually get food at any particular kill and quite often have to just sort of scrounge out to live in on their own. But the benefit to doing that is 99% of all the babies born into a clan are fathered by males that have left other clans. So the trade-off there, do I stay at home and do I get fed when mom brings back food and I, I take part in protecting the family but I don't have offspring or do I leave the clan and I live a bit more of a harder life but I get to father my own young. I suppose that's a question that until we can speak to these animals we won't really know. Hey? But anyway, quite interesting. Good question there. Huh? Now here's the wildebeest's track. James Richard who's joining us again. Good morning James. It's nice to hear you so often on, on the, well, in my ear at least anyway. This is a wildebeest track. I'll answer your question now James. Um, you can see that it's a fairly large track. I'm going to put my hand next to it. I haven't got the biggest hands in the world, but you can definitely see that that's a large track. For an antelope that weighs almost 400 pounds, that's exactly what he needs. Cloven hoof with very sharp hard edges is one of Mother Nature's ways of making sure that these animals can run the fastest. That, if we had to make a running shoe out of it, would probably be, uh, in terms of ergonomics, the best the best way of running through the bush. Nice hard edges, they can use these edges to dig into the sand and make the sharp corners that they can. But James, I'm going to miss out on your question right now. I'll answer it in a second. Jamie's got some cats to show you. Here we go. Not a bad start to our morning. I know it's very, very far away, but there is a male lion having a quick drink around Sydney's dam. Now, Sydney's Dam falls just to the north of our Traverse area, so although you can see a vehicle there, unfortunately we cannot travel across to where that line is, which means that we have to watch him from a distance. 
We were on our way to see if we couldn't see the Guhuma females with their buffalo kill. And I'm relatively certain that this male lion has gone across to join them before coming for a drink. Sure, look at that round belly. That is a very full lion. Doesn't look like a male though. I know it's, it's really hard to tell. I'm just going to grab my binoculars here. Uh, that's not a male lion. That's definitely not a male lion. That's a lioness. So that's one of the Inkahumas coming across from her buffalo kill to have a drink at Sydney's Dam. And she's gone into the dip. I'm a little bit afraid to move at this point, just due to our signal. We're very fortunate to have any around Sydney's Dam. We're doing exceptionally well, considering this is a relatively bad area. But for now, there's a very noisy starling in front of me that's making a great deal of noise. It's unfortunately right in front of our antenna. But it is chirping away furiously at us. And there you go, a Birchall's starling. And for us this morning, that's going to be much closer than the lions. You hear it calling away. Picking at That's lovely. Not often we get to see a starling calling. Picking away at the meagre offerings that the ground has. A couple of grass seeds, whatever else it can find there. We're going to try and reposition to get a little bit closer to the Inkahumas and their buffalo kill. While we do, let's find out what other wonderful things Steph has found on foot. Now you caught us busy walking down the road. As we mentioned, we're trying to get to Trias Dam. But by the end of the show, we're in no rush to get there at all at the moment. But we're walking down here, just admiring this beautiful sunrise that we've got. Cutting through this thicket of quite well established, in my opinion, some of the biggest of the silver cluster leaves on this particular property. If you're having a look over there, is of an apple leaf on the left hand side, one of the protected trees here, and a silver cluster leaf on the right hand side. The one on the left, used to make, traditionally used to make toilet seats and spoons and eating utensils, and the one on the right used for spades and axe handles and support structures for buildings. Two completely different uses from two completely different trees from two completely unrelated families growing 10 yards from one another using the same minerals and the same water and the same sunlight. I don't know. If that doesn't blow your mind, that to me is very, very, very interesting. Now on a misty day like today, quite often what you're getting is you're getting a lot of condensation on leaves. And this is some condensation on the young leaves of a silver cluster leaf tree. And what is really, really awesome about this type of condensation is that you can collect it. What you do is you take your sock off. It's not going to be the most hygienic and I won't take my socks off for you today. <laughs> but you take your sock off and you dab it or you walk through touching this. And as you'll see, I'm going to try and see if I can get some water to collect for you. It's not a lot, but you can see there, it's definitely two or three drops of water per leaf. Now what you do is you take that water, you wring your sock out into a snail's shell and you collect the water that you want. Or if you're really thirsty, you can suck your socks dry, but that's not something that I'm going to do. I'm going to try and add some perfume to that 
water as quickly as I can. <laughs> but anyway, some dew collection early in the morning is a good time to collect water if you just so happen by some miracle to be stuck out here without any other means. I can hear some elephant breaking some branches off to our right hand side and I think it definitely warrants a little bit of an inspection. We've got these really big herds of, of elephant walking through Juma at the moment. I mean, just in the last few weeks, we've seen herds numbering in the 40s and in the 50s, which I haven't really seen anywhere else in the Kruger National Park. I think the largest herd I've seen in the Kruger National Park has been an elephant herd of about 50, and then I saw an elephant herd in the Manuleti of way over 100 elephants, although I think that was a bit of a conglomeration. Elephants will herd together around a common resource and the magic around a conglomeration of elephant that size is it's usually made up of related cows. The matriarchs in all those elephant herds will be related to one another and bringing their families together. It's a sort of family gathering. Right, and while we, I think, just so that I'm not too distracted while we go and look for these elephants, we're going to link to Brent who's finally got to cheetah plain. So lions and bushwalk are out. Now isn't that great? The Nkuma ladies, from what I can hear, have caught a buffalo. Unfortunately, they're not being very kind to us and they've caught a buffalo to the north of our traverse area. But we still get a couple of visuals uh, across at Sydney's waterhole. So let's hope the cats of Cheetah Plains are going to be a little bit more forthcoming. Uh, Jeanre, just, just to let you know, but our aerial is down. Thank you. So we're about to appear onto the vast open plains of the cheetah. And wouldn't it be wonderful on this misty morning to have some of those cats just pacing across the open area. So let's go have a look. Of course, we're always in the lookout for leopards as well, but unfortunately no tracks just yet. And I haven't heard anything on the Game Drive channel, but I think quarantine is supposed to be somewhere on Cheetah Plains. For those of you who are not sure who Quarantine is, he's a male leopard who's about four years old and he is the dominant female from Juma's last successful litter, well him and his brother. His brother is now unfortunately quite far to the south which makes me very sad because he was my favorite. But uh, Quarantine, second favorite, he's still around so, and this is the area we do see him in. So far I've only seen him once since he departed Juma and became a nomadic independent male leopard. It is just absolutely gorgeous at the moment. I mean, look at this light streaming through and with the dew on the ground, little diamondly, diamond like sparkles shining at us. Now this is the tree I most want to see a leopard in, on cheetah plants. Every time I come past this cassia, I look not only in the tree but in the termite, on the termite mound as well. And I have seen photos of Mr. Quarantine on this very spot. He just hasn't decided to grace us with his presence here just yet. And of course, when we move further to the east, this is always a good area for Nkanyanini and her two cubs. We've only seen them once on the live drives, so fingers crossed we can make it a hat trick today. Always checking for tracks. Andre, what's going to be at the pan? Make a call. Did you say cheetah? Jandre has made a very big call. I'm going to go with wildebeest. Uh, but Jandre said there's going to be cheetah at the pan. We're cheetah, on a cheetah on top of a wildebeest. Jandre is feeling most lucky this morning. So if we don't see anything, I'm going to ask you guys permission. Can I get a stick and beat Jandre with it if we don't see a cheetah on top of a wildebeest? Jandre is now looking a little bit more nervous than he was a few seconds ago. I'm quite confident. 
He's quite confident. So there we go. Guys, why don't you tell us what you think we're going to see at Cheetah Plains Pan? And uh, let us know by sending us an email at questions. The email is questions at wildair.tv. Or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Are we going to encounter Jean-Rex Cheetah atop a wildebeest? Or are we going to encounter my just single wildebeest? Let us see. jean the moment of truth is arriving. I'm looking carefully for a nice, really bendy stick and then I can get some whip into. Although, I won't lie, I am, I am quite hoping jean is right in this case. Wouldn't that be spectacular? And we're about to appear at the Cheetah Plains pan. And we were both wrong, but there is an absolutely gorgeous sighting right here and I think it's so gorgeous I'm gonna to have to take my camera out and I encourage you guys to do the same grab some screenshots share them with us you can share them on our Facebook page Safari Live or pop them on Twitter with a hashtag Safari Live now where's my camera isn't that spectacular a giraffe in the sunrise oh dear I've just got to be on the radio for a second. I've got to find the right radio. Standing by. Isn't that magnificent? Oh, it's quite difficult to see. You can see the giraffe in the sunrise. Andrew, go ahead. So we've got to keep the cameraman honest and this nice early morning backlight is going to test the genre's skills. Oh, isn't that exquisite? So for those of you not sure what that clicking is, that's just my camera. And as I said, do the same. Grab some screenshots. Look at the birds flying around that giraffe. Isn't that just gorgeous? And the giraffe making life a little bit easier for Jean Ray by moving away from the rising sun, but still with the mist behind, giving us the most incredible photographic opportunity. So while you guys are looking at the giraffe, I'm perusing the open plain, seeing if there's possibly not the fabled cheetah that jean -Dre was talking about. So we just you know, watch this giraffe move swiftly towards the tree line. Now, oh, that is just beautiful. So it's a female giraffe. There could be a few more around, but I haven't seen any. I just see her at the moment, which is unusual. Normally with females, there's a couple around, but they could be in the tree line. Lion! 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 Male lion! Sorry guys, I got very excited, so <laughs> there we go. Look at that! <laughs> wow! <laughs> We're sitting there, and I, was, I saw the giraffe suddenly turn around and look. 
and I sort of followed the giraffe's eye line, and look at that, it's a male lion. Oh, it's a flat male lion with a fat belly. Now, is this a Birmingham, or is this a mystery lion? Let's get a little bit closer. <laughs> That's what you say, like in the bush, you never know what's around the next corner. This is so exciting. I'm hoping it's new lines that we haven't seen before. The giraffe was staring and I just sort of followed the giraffe eye line. That's not a wildebeest. So there we go, Jandre. I think I won't beat you because there was a cat. If there wasn't a cat, I would have beat him. Now this could be a Birmingham, it could be a, a male from Kruger. Andrew's there, I saw Andrew, Andrew spotted the lion about the same time as us, he was also watching the giraffe. Oh, isn't that going to be stunning in this light, a nice big male lion. Morning everyone, Morning. how's everyone doing? Is it Birmingham? Well? I am not sure, must be. Must be. Yeah, must be. Were you trying to call me for him earlier? Yeah. <laughs> I answered. And I'm looking at the giraffe, and then suddenly I see this lion walk out of the bush. Yeah, no problem. He's here, so. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Yeah. A bit of mud on him. Yeah. He's a bit hungry. Not too hungry, but he could definitely do with a meal. And he's now heading back towards the pan where we were. So, he's going to let Andrew go ahead of us, and we'll catch up now. And look at that giraffe. It's now decided the lion is getting too close, close and it's running. There it goes. High speed giraffe. And there goes the male lion towards the pan. Let's get around. I think he's going to go for a drink. So let's get in the, the spot to see that beautiful big cat lapping up the cool water of the cheetah pan's pan. See, he sniffs, sniffs the gory wish and wait for it. Tests of urine. something really exciting happening. I know Brent has just disappeared off your screen. Just watch these Impala. Something has upset them terribly. Apart from the male with laryngitis, who we are discounting. What is going on, guys? What has upset you so much? Impala have such a difficult time at the moment because they're rutting. So the males are constantly interested, even if it means ignoring a potential predator. But at the same time, there's something here. I'm trying to work out exactly where they're looking. Yeah, it sounds absolutely ridiculous. I'm looking off this way, what have they seen? We're all focusing their attention behind us. 
Something in this direction. And while we focus really carefully on figuring out what's up, a set these Impala as much as it has. Let's go back across to Brent on Cheetah Plains. Look at this, guys. Isn't this gorgeous? He's just arrived at the pan, and I'm afraid the light is quite difficult. He's gone straight into the, into the sunlight, so we're going to have to move, because otherwise we're not going to be able to see him. But that's, what I, that's the wonderful thing. I mean, we came down here looking for Cheetah, and instead of Cheetah, we find a male lion. It does look to be one of the Birmingham boys. And uh, for those of you not sure who the Birmingham boys and what the Birmingham boys are, the Birmingham boys are a dominant male lion coalition. And the reason they're called the Birmingham boys is that they come from a farm uh, to the north of us in, in the Timbervati called Birmingham. So they were born on that property. How's that, Chandra? There we go. A little bit easier to see him now that he's not hiding behind the sunrise. Thirsty kitty. up that water. Are we getting that, John? Eh? So, we, ch we saw that giraffe and shell bell. We'd like to know, would a single male lion like this be able to have taken that giraffe down. With great difficulty, yes, generally they prefer to hunt uh, giraffe in prides, but I actually have seen a, a single male lion take down an adult giraffe before, so it is possible, just unlikely. So, Shell Bell, that giraffe definitely made the right choice by skedaddling. So even though he's part of a coalition of four males, it's not unusual to find them by themselves. They do split quite often and travel vast distance on their own, patrolling their territories. But if he had to encounter any trouble, and trouble being another group of male lions, he'd call in for backup from the other coalition members. Here we go, contact call. Isn't that gorgeous as he walks through the light? So if you're new and you want to know more about this incredible male lion we're watching, you can ask me any questions you'd like, and you can do that by sending me an email on questions at wildearth.tv, or if you are a little bit more technologically savvy, use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, and you can ask me anything you want about this beautiful big male lion who's stopping for his morning constitutional. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to get around ahead of him and hopefully if we get if we get it right we can have that big male lion walking straight at us 
I mean, there's an incredible thing about big cat's eyes. They really do seem like they look straight through you. Like the thousand yard stare. There he is, and there's Andrew in the background. Hello, Dara in Iowa. Dara would like to know, are lions water dependent? They're actually not, Dara, it's quite interesting, but if there is water available, they will always drink. But the, the Desert lions of the Kalahari and the Namib can get enough moisture from their prey as not to need any water. But if there is water available, they will take that opportunity to drink every time. So, Dara, you might be a new, new to asking questions. That's the first question I've had from Dara, so welcome, Dara, and keep sending those questions in. So what I'm going to try to do is get in front of him so he walks straight at us. And there's a, the giraffe who skedaddled earlier. She's going to have to put her running shoes on again because the male lion's heading straight towards her. Oh, she's already put her running shoes on before Jean Ray could get her. Justin's wondering how large does a male lion's mane get? There he is, just stopping for a sniff before he comes towards us and a quick double spray. Come on, choose the right path. Have we chosen the right path? Justin's wondering how big does a male lion's mane get? Now, Justin, it completely depends on the individual. Some will have manes that extend all the way down their belly. Others will just stop like this. As they get older, they tend to, the manes tend to get bigger. Gonna walk right next to us. Oh, he needs to smell. Oh, he's changed his direction now. He's coming to smell the rain tree or apple leaf. I mean, you can see those big scratches on his back. And male lions are always in a constant state of injury, they're constantly fighting. If they're not fighting to defend their territory from other males, they're fighting with each other for mating rights, for food. Okay. He obviously didn't read my script, which was he was supposed to walk right next to Jandre. He decided to change his direction. On a positive note, his direction at the moment means he seems to be staying in Cheetah Plains at that. His, his last direction, he was heading towards Nkoro. Oh, he's back on the Nkoro Road now. Let's just try. Let's see if he reads the script this time. He's not listening to me today. He's got his own agenda. Sorry about the waggling radio, but that's so I can hear um, the radio aerial. That's so I can hear final control. We are very far on Cheetah Plains from the final control.
Hi Sandy, a huge welcome to Safari Live. Sandy is wondering, if the females are the hunters, how do males get food when they're on their own? Sandy, that is a huge misconception uh, that's been created over the years. The males are incredibly capable hunters and they spend a lot of time away from the females. So they will hunt by themselves, but if there's an opportunity to grab a free meal off the females, they'll jump onto that. So they are very capable hunters and they probably spend about 60% of their time away from the females. So they do a lot of their own hunting. And males hunting tend to bring down slightly bigger prey. So capable of bringing down giraffe, buffalo, hippo, and in certain cases, young elephant. So males are by no means slouches in the hunting department. But if the females catch something and there's a free meal about, the males will definitely not say no. We're just going to try to jump around. zigzag our way through the puzzle bush. So we did see that beautiful female giraffe earlier and Nancy G is wondering, is this lion hunting the giraffe? He's not, Nancy. He's, he's, he's not really hunting at the moment. He looks like he's more on patrol. He could be looking for other members of the male lion coalition. And we did hear him do those soft contact calls earlier. So he's going to look for other lions. So he is going to a bit of a thick area. We will try to stay with him. Let's try to see. It's a very thick block. And he is moving towards our northern edge of our traverse area on Cheetah Plains. Let's see. I think I know about a sneaky little open seep area that we can get into. <coughs> Aha, uh -huh. so while we try to get ourselves in a good position for that male lion, let's go see what Jamie's up to. I haven't figured out exactly what's going on or where these impala are or what these impala are shouting at. I've been off the vehicle, I went for a little bit of a quick walk around this area. Still no sign of what's alerted them to or what's caused those alarm calls. Lots and lots of hornbills in that tree. They haven't been alarm calling at all, which is very telling. They've been completely silent through all of this. And hornbills, alarm, they will alarm call at things like leopards and lions. The impala have gone silent now. It makes me wonder if whatever they were alarm calling at hasn't moved along. <laughs> the hornbills taking advantage of the morning sun on this really frosty morning. Could be a lion making their way, making its way towards the rest of the Inkahumas with their buffalo kill just, just on the wrong side of our boundary. I don't think so though. I haven't found any tracks. There's nothing ahead of me. And talking of lions and boundaries, our lion is about to disappear, so back over to Brent. So he's steadily mobile north. And unfortunately we're getting quite close to the Inkoro boundary. And there he is there. So 
I think he's looking for one of the other coalition members. So we'll, we'll definitely stay with him as long as we can and hopefully he's reading the script now and he's going to come walk straight at us down the road. Let's give him a little bit of space. Okay, he's going to stop for a quick scent mark. Isn't that beautiful? There, those eyes, they definitely see through you. Now, there's a couple of reasons that that lion always, or leopard, looks like it's seeing through you. So, it's because of how their eyes are designed. They only see in sort of greys, blacks, and whites. So, very, very good at picking up movement and for night vision. But they don't see nearly the same amount of detail that we can see and they don't see any of the colors we can see. Uh, that's why quite often people think the black and white of a zebra, now that's a weird color for camouflage, but if the predators only see in black and white, then it's a very good camouflage. Oh, what well, it looks like he's being very obliging. And he's going to stop inside our Travis area, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> We've had a bit of bad luck with like, cats leaving recently, so I suppose it's only fair we get a little bit of good luck. How's that, John? Eh? So, Brent, asking Brent a question, Brent is wondering, how do male lions get separated and meet up? Sometimes, meet up? sometimes we see them together, sometimes we see them by themselves. So mostly they'll meet up by calling and also by smell, they'll be able to smell where the other males have been. But to pinpoint exactly, it's generally done by that magnificent lion's roar. A look. I'm not sure where he's come from, but he could have walked quite a distance already this evening. Andrew's nodding at me, <laughs> so he's come from a distance. I think he's the one who came from Chitwa Chitwa. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> from Malamala. Mala Mala. So he's been on the march for quite a while. Uh, he deserves a good break. So while we wait to see what this male lion's up to, let's go across to Steph, who's on Shank's pony with the largest living land mammal. Well, we're standing here on the side of a drainage line. And I'm sorry that I'm whispering like I am, but Basically, we're standing no more than 50 feet from what seems to be 20 or 30 elephant. Now, when you last left us, Viam and I were trying to find these elephant, and we found them. And this is the lead elephant. Is he eating that tree that you're seeing over there? Now, we're in a fairly safe position. We are on the other side of a drainage line with quite steep banks. As VM's going to try and show you now, we had a game path now, but you'll see that where he's going to point here on our left, we actually got quite a big embankment between us and the elephant. And that's a good thing. You want some height between you and an elephant. But that being said, just have a look at how deep into that bush that elephant is feeding 
And obviously, that's one of the strengths of being the size of an elephant is that you can push your way through this barrier of thorns that a, a tree provides and go and eat at all the leaves and juicy bits on the inside of a tree that other animals don't ever get close to. Just the face of that elephant at the moment that we can see. Like I said, it's forming the first it's forming the first of a group of elephant that we sort of have visual of coming down the slope towards us. And all we're busy doing is keeping our eyes peeled to see if we don't get outflanked by this elephant. Or by the elephants, I should say. Now this time of the year, elephants are probably feeding for around 18 to 20 hours a day just so that they can get enough nutrition from the vegetation that they eat. They will sleep, they do sleep lying down and they take turns to sleep and usually at night time. They will corral themselves for a few hours at night, a few hours in the middle of the day. And the youngsters love to take a nap in the middle of the day. The older elephant will usually sleep on the side of termite mounds and embankments of sand, allowing the slope of the hill to help them to roll back onto their feet again. This time of the year though, not quite feeding the 24 hours a day it will get to towards the end of the dry season. We're going to look at around about 22 to 24 hours of feeding time. <laughs> the elephant is just trying to stuff the whole tree into his mouth, I think, at the same time. Now, for many of you whose first time it is to come onto a bushwalk like this, you'll notice that I'm speaking quite softly. The reason for that is that people on foot definitely re cause a different reaction to animals in a vehicle. In a vehicle you can get very close to these animals most of the time. They don't actually even react to you being there. On foot though, those comfort zones are much bigger. and Animals react to humans on foot from a much greater distance away. And it's for that reason that I'm speaking softly. I don't want to alarm this elephant. And it's for that reason that we've sought refuge behind this drainage line that we have. A bit of additional cover, for lack of a better word. Right, while well, we try and find a nice place to get a better view of the rest of the herd of the elephant, I'm going to send you back over to Jamie. Well, Steph gets a better view of the elephant herd. I'm not sure that there's a better view to be found on Juma than the one that we are currently enjoying and sharing with a male wildebeest. The mist is still clinging to the low-lying areas. And that, by the way, that you're looking at with all the mist is the Mawati drainage line. The wildebeest seems to be enjoying the view as well. Also, just taking the moment to bask in the morning sun, which I can completely sympathize with. It's really nice sitting here with the sun shining on us. I find wildebeest incredibly enjoyable to watch. something so entertaining and so out of this world. When you look at the shape of their faces and their horns. It's hard to imagine that this animal is a part of the antelope family. It's so easy to picture them as cow-like, and yet of course they're not. Related to Hartebius and Tsesebi. And of all of the animals out here, 
This is probably in terms of where we are. You're unlikely to see a Tsetsebe. He's one of the fastest antelope species. But sloped back and powerful shoulders make for a very speedy animal, but also an animal that is capable of maintaining those speeds for really extended periods of time. Oh. And while our wildebeest has a quick scratch behind the ear, Brent's lion is giving himself a thorough cleaning in the morning. Okay, so we're still with this beautiful big boy. And <laughs> he's looking like he's getting comfortable. I think a bit of preening. Oh, and it's a tired kitty. So male lions can walk some big distances on their nightly meanderings and they can walk up to about 25 kilometers. Oh, look at that. There's a nice fresh bite mark. More than likely from one of his fellow coalition members. Let's go have a quick look at that bite again, please, Andre. Okay, it definitely looks like two canine punctures. Very superficial wound. You can see the ticks in his hair next to it. Mm, maybe a day or two old, that wound. I said very superficial. It looks like a bite, so more than likely encountered while feeding. Just from where it is, it's quite a weird position to have a bite if he was fighting. So I think probably while they were feeding, there was a bit of an altercation over some meat with one of the other coalition, or even a lioness. Yeah, look at that. Give himself a good lick. <clears throat> and then oh, he's rolled over. Tired of us. and back over. Oh, isn't that gorgeous? Look at that light coming through his mane. Oh, he's, he's making some low... Looks like he might roar. He got us all there. <laughs> Looked like he was about to roar and then he sort of stopped halfway through. So low contact calls. He's definitely listening something to something to the north. There we go, there's that low contact call again. Wouldn't it be incredible if he gave us one of those bone-chilling, earth-vibrating roars this morning. And you can see all the scars on his face. Being a male lion is, is, is not easy. Being at the top of the lion world and constantly in battle with other lions and each other. Come on, give us a roar. There we go.
give us a big roll. <laughs> he just keeps teasing us with those little contact calls. Lifting his nose to the wind, the breeze is coming towards him. He's just smelling what might be out there. Mm. <laughs> Very forlorn little groan. It's like, where's everyone? Where's everyone? Mm. So it's still cool enough that he might move a bit. And probably in an hour or so it's going to be too warm and he's going to find a nice shady spot to rest for the day. But while wow, there's a potential of him stomping about, we'll be right here next to him. Oh. Hello to Sandy from Tennessee. Sandy would like to know how far can those contact calls be heard from? and when they do roar properly, how far does that travel? So, Sandy, those little contact calls are, are generally made for quite close, no more than a couple of hundred meters, maybe at the most a kilometer. But when he does roar properly, those incredibly deep vibrations from a male lion can be heard for, by human beings up to about 10 kilometers, maybe even a little bit more, but by lions, probably close to 25, 30 kilometers. So it is incredible sound that just travels. And the reason lions generally call at night or in the early morning when it's still, is it gives them that little bit of extra distance when they're not competing with all the sounds of the day. So it is, it is amazing how far they can call. And they can call about as far as they can walk in the night, which is quite, an, I find quite an interesting thing. So if I shout, I definitely can't shout as far as I can walk, but a male lion can. Now, I'll tell you guys a really funny story. <laughs> Anna Marie says this lion's doing the best imitation of my contact call. Anna Marie, I think I do the best imitation of a lion contact call, not the other way around. But I'm going to tell you guys a funny story about lions and my parents. So, as I'm sure a lot of you know, my, my mother was quite the tennis player. Uh, she was ranked number four in the world in, in the late 70s. And she's got a couple of Wimbledon mixed double titles and US Open titles. And, and uh, when she was about 20 one years old she met a long-haired Zambian who became my father. So once they got married they did the sort of fancy honeymoon on the beach and then my dad said okay off we go and put her in a tiny little A-frame two-man tent and dragged her off to the wilds of northern Botswana and up until recently she'd been living in Boston which oh, <laughs> I was very lazy, mister. Oh, up on the move again. Okay, while we reposition, I'll keep telling you the story. So, if you drive from South Africa, and the first sort of big wilderness area you get to in Botswana is probably Naipan National Park. So, my dad, being the chivalrous gentleman that he is, um, went and started the fire and they'd seen lions out in game drive that evening and uh, 
started the fire, they made dinner. And, um, my, they had big blow-up mattresses that my dad had specially sort of spurged on for this camping trip. And of course, within 30 seconds, um, my mother had gone, oh, mattress, jumped on it before my dad had managed to clear and popped the mattress. So he gave my mom the mattress. But later that night, after dinner, they just got into the tent, gone to bed, and a male lion started roaring. And my mother goes, Kevin, 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 how far away is that lion? My dad says, oh, I don't know, four or five kilometers. He says my mother stayed quiet for about 10 minutes. And then she went, Kevin, Kevin, how far can a male lion walk in a night? My dad said, I don't know, 25, 30 kilometers. That was it, first night out in the bush and honeymoon, unzipped into the car. So my dad got the, the, the mattress that was pumped and uh, my mom slept in the car because she was scared of the lions. And fast forward 36 years, now my mother goes off tracking lions by herself. And unfortunately this male lion is departing into Nkoro, so out of our traverse zone. Goodbye, mister. So as this male lion shows us his bottom and disappears to the north of our Travis area, a huge welcome to Christina, who's a new viewer who accidentally stumbled across us. So welcome, Christina. And Christina says, is this a stupid question? Uh, can lions recognize each other's roars? And Christina, there's no such thing as a stupid question, just a stupid answer. But yes, they can, Christina. And when a lion calls, it's to sort of identify itself and identify uh, that the fact that this is this, it's its territory and it doesn't let the other lions come into it. So with males, you have coalitions and the male coalitions will defend a set area and the lionesses will also defend a set area against other, ooh, other lionesses. But, so that male lion's crossed out of our Travis area, unfortunately, so I think we should go look for some cheetah, and I have to go back to the last place. I saw a pangolin just in case. And while we do that, let's go see what Jamie's up to back on Juma. Well, fingers crossed that Brent manages to find that pangolin. Now, his lion has wandered out of our traverse area but we've heard a lion calling not too far from treehouse dam and i'm on my way there as we speak fingers crossed that wendy's signal holds out and that we manage to figure out exactly where this lion is steph is also following up he also heard the lion the first thing i did because apparently there were elephants around here was to make sure that Steph was no longer on foot with that particular elephant um, herd. So they were around here Henry. somewhere, and I can see lots of evidence in terms of fresh elephant dung as well as fresh trees that have been pushed over. It's just a matter of figuring out exactly where they are. What I didn't want to do was drive into the sighting for a couple of reasons whilst Steph was here. And that was to do with just making sure that we avoided them so that we didn't startle the elephants in any way and put the elephants and Steph at any kind of risk. I can't see where they are though. Oh, hee <laughs> hey, I spotted them. Dave, do you see them there? They're hiding. They're hiding. They're running away from us. They've just gone behind the trees. Not the elephants. Steph, I mean. He just ducked behind there. I saw Liam's aerial bobbing about. And there we go. We timed that well, making sure that they are not in the vicinity of those elephants. Apparently, the elephants were somewhere in this drainage line. So we're just going to look for them first, quickly. Amazing how a big grey animal can disappear. Several tons worth of elephant have vanished off somewhere into the trees. As, as did Steph and Viam. They were marching through here. 
know that they're hiding, I know that they're ducking down and trying to remain invisible. N not the elephants, that is. The elephants are... Oh! You have to be exceptionally impressed with our cameraman who operated the camera handheld on the bushwalks with that enormous backpack on and an aerial that makes them about as tall as a giraffe, but now they've got to navigate through the bushes and keep the camera steady. Quite incredible. If they're checking this road, then we shall not head down that way. We'll try and make our way on a different route. you'll get to have a look at the newly revamped Treehouse Dam. Now, those of you who are regular viewers will know that whenever we used to drive across the Treehouse Dam wall, we always used to concentrate very hard on the way that we were steering, making sure that we didn't go tumbling off the edge. There wasn't very much in the way of space. In terms of, ah, there the elephants in terms of driving along. I'm going to take you a little bit closer to them. But now our treehouse dam wall is beautifully wide and perfect for driving along. Okay. I'm always keeping my fingers crossed that we get to see that incredible tusker. I saw the screenshots that you all posted yesterday evening. There's a particularly large bull at the back there. I'm just going to switch off because he's approaching quite close to another vehicle. I'm just going to give them some space. Oh my goodness. Oh wow. Look at that little baby. That is a brand, brand new elephant calf. That's incredible. I think that that's the one that we saw yesterday, Vim and myself, before we went to the Inkahumas. Oh, look at it. Oh, that little thing is just a couple of days old. Hello, little one. Oh, you are so tiny. Look at the male sniffing it. <laughs> Baby is so confused to what's going on. The male is so curious. Look at the size difference. The male on the right and then the female, the mother of this car. And then that tiny, tiny baby. Oh, you precious little thing. These are the sightings. Oh, no. Come on, boy. Don't bully the little one. Oh, shame. It's so confused. Oh, these are the moments that make life in the bush so incredibly special. Shame. The female's a little bit distressed, actually. She can't fight back against that male. Now, he's probably picking up on the scent of her hormones. We see it with Impala, where they get very confused after they have their baby. Oh, look at that little one reaching up to try and suckle. Come on, Mom. Keep your baby away from him. Cute. 
such a brand new baby. As I said, we're going to stick right here just so that we don't disrupt the sighting. Well, that baby is really just a couple of days old. Oh, there's the male again, harassing the female a little bit. And Justin, you were wondering about how big an elephant calf is when it is born and when they start eating solid food. So at birth, an elephant calf weighs between about 80 to 100 kilograms in size. So, you know, we say, oh, cute, it's so tiny. That's only relative to the size of the mom. They are actually relatively large after that 22-month gestation period. Oh, wow. We're so lucky to see that. And then... In terms of when they eat solid food, well, Justin, it's about six months of age when an elephant calf starts to munch on solids. But even then, they will continue to feed from the mother, so she will continue to lactate for at least another six months after that, usually about a year after that. So they can suckle for up to a year and a half, even longer in some instances. And they have spectacular weaning tantrums. Like, Nothing you have ever seen. If you think that the hyenas are interesting when they squeal at their mothers, a, an elephant calf that is being weaned will scream and screech and throw a full-on tantrum when it is not allowed access to milk. A very interesting process, but at around six months of age is when they first start to eat solid food, when their teeth are developed enough and their stomachs and their digestive system are developed enough for them to eat solid food. I'm going to try and reposition so that we can see that calf. Obviously, I'm not going to try and follow them, especially with a mom with a new baby that's now being harassed by the male. He's picking up on the hormones of her pregnancy, just like in Parla do when they go, when the ewes give birth, they go into what's known as a false or a false rut on the male's side. And I think that's why he's harassing her, but he is absolutely enormous. He's just, he's not even head and shoulders. Above the average female in this herd. He is huge. It is so fortunate that we are lucky enough to see this little elephant calf just, I would guess, maybe just a couple of days after its birth. When I saw this elephant calf, I'm relatively certain it's the same one. When I saw it yesterday, I guessed that it was just a few hours old. Now, something I have yet to be gifted with in terms of sighting in the bush, sightings in the bush, is the birth of a, an elephant calf. I've come very close to seeing it once. I was on foot and I wandered across just after the elephant had given birth and Blue Butterfrog, you were wondering about whether or not I have ever witnessed an elephant birth. I came through on foot and I found this sort of trampled patch of earth and a placenta, the elephant's placenta, which is enormous, absolutely, absolutely enormous, and it was still warm, along with the baby's mycomium, mycomium, the elephant's, the baby elephant's first dung, which is totally different consistency to any elephant dung you've ever seen, like, like a newborn baby, um, those of you who have children or grandchildren, you'll be familiar with that that first um, defecation from a baby. And the elephant dung is exactly the same. It's this very strange, almost clay-like consistency, which sounds like a bizarre observation, but it was so integral to what had happened. You could just picture this elephant giving birth. We had a placenta right in front of us, warm, still steaming, in the, in, it was a winter's morning. We could still, I mean, we could tell that she'd just had it. The, the elephants themselves were just off about 50 meters into the bushes, but I didn't want to try and follow them on foot. It was definitely not a good idea with a female that's just given birth. I have seen videos of people who've been fortunate enough to witness such an event in the Kruger National Park, where they have 
videotaped it. And that whole process is such an integral part of an elephant herd's bonding experience. And I'm just sitting here, I'm just keeping an eye on the elephants, trying to see if we can't get a glimpse of that new, new baby once again. But I obviously I'm not going to push any further or try and get any closer. And unfortunately, they have moved further into the drainage line. But um, yes, that whole herd bands together from what I've seen and protects the mother concerned, particularly if she is a new mom, if it's her first baby. The older females will step in and they will mentor her in terms of handling the whole situation, which as you can imagine is very scary for an animal like an elephant that is so cognizant of what is going on in their lives. They've got such a high level of emotional development. You can see they're tucked away in there. Sure, I wonder if Steph realized just what was hiding in the middle of that herd. The male has moved away. And Linda Grave, you were wondering whether or not that male would hurt the baby. If he did, it would be a minor kind of hurt. Yes, he could, and yes, he might. But they are much, much tougher than we are, naturally. Um, so you saw there what he was doing. He was curious. He was sniffing the calf. He was scaring the calf, unfortunately. He was kind of pulling it away from the mom, just out of sheer curiosity. However, as I said, elephants are seriously emotionally developed and he would never have seriously injured the baby. So they've got an incredible amount of space in their brains devoted to proprioception and their spatial awareness. So the male knew exactly what he was doing. He knew exactly where that calf was and how to handle it. He might have hurt it a little bit, but he would never seriously injure it in any kind of way. Now you can compare and contrast that to a rhino which has a very different mating style. And when a female comes into estrus, her calf is about a year and a half old. Now the calves are only independent at about three when the next calf is born. But at about a year and a half, it's the most traumatic time in a calf's life because the female goes back into estrus and she goes through about a two week courting period where she will reject the male but the male gets exceptionally aggressive, the female also gets aggressive and it can occasionally cause quite serious injury to the male and vice versa. The male resents the presence of anything coming between him and the female regardless of whether or not it is a calf. And I've had some extraordinary sightings of male rhino chasing squealing calves away from their mothers and they do occasionally injure them if the calves get in the way particularly male calves. And it's, a, it's a completely different style from the elephants. And yes, absolutely, Gen B, if it got too much, if that female felt like her calf was being far too stressed out and she was upset, if she communicated that to the rest of the herd, yes. The matriarchs of the herd, or the the older females of the herd would band together and they would attempt to push that male away. Uh, within an elephant herd, a male is always dominant, a big male, particularly a male of that size. He's about twice the size of every single female in this herd. Uh, they'd have their work cut out for them, but they would attempt to push him away and they'd probably be successful if they were determined enough. Uh, not something to be concerned about. It's just, it's difficult to watch from such a human perspective. Because, of course, our, we are naturally concerned about the new mother and the calf, particularly where you can see that the calf is upset and confused by the actions of the male. But he'll never hurt it. And yes, the females will absolutely step in and push that male away if the female was starting to feel confused. If she is the same female that I saw yesterday, and I suspect that she might be, she's quite young. If I had to guess, I would say that she's around 20 or so years old. It's a guess, and I did see her from quite a distance. 
But just judging by, I know Brent was talking about this yesterday, but just judging by the, the, temporal, gland, the temporal area and the sort of level of protrusions of the bones around the skull and then just her general size suggested to me that this could even have been her first calf. Maybe her first calf, maybe her second calf, if that. So she's relatively inexperienced. And yesterday when I saw her, she was all on her own and she was stressed. She was not unhappy with us, but she was clearly a bit freaked out by the fact that she had this brand new baby that she had to protect. And that's why we left. We didn't even try and put the little baby on screen. We were experiencing technical issues but we just left that sighting almost immediately because it was clear to me that that baby had only just emerged into the world and I didn't want to cause her any further problems. I'm just trying to decide if there's going to be an, a view from the road on the other side of this drainage line. Unfortunately, I don't think so. And they seem to be relatively content to stay where they are, they're not really on the move. That big bull has moved off. I don't know where the female with her brand new baby went. It was so easy to tell that that little baby was new to the world. It was all wobbly, like it was still trying to find its feet. Absolutely wonderful. There is nothing in the world that will put a smile on my face like a baby elephant. Except maybe a baby rhino. This, it's, a fine, it's a fine balance. Let's try and just go around. We might encounter that male. He's walking towards the other road. You see, I don't want to go off-road and disturb them. But let's see if we can't get a different view on the herd. And this is what makes these live safaris so incredible. Because it's happening in real time right here in the African bush, you get to share these experiences. And also live in the knowledge that that little baby has got 50 to 60 odd years ahead of it. If it's a female, it will be with the rest of the herd. If it is a male, Oh, it is there. It's right in between those trees. If we go, we can go forward a little bit. It's very tricky there. It might be in the gap now. No. <laughs> Dave's just that little bit higher than me. <laughs> He's got a tree right in the way. The baby is there, looking safe and sound and happy, just to update you. I know you can't see it, but I can from my slightly lower angle. Let me try going backwards a bit. Oh. There you go. And there's some youngsters in the back moving in front of the elephant calf. The elephant calf is just behind that female uh, through the trees. If you look really carefully, you might be able to see it. But unfortunately, that is the best view that I can give you. Now, Justin, on the subject of elephant calves, you were wondering if an elephant abandons its baby, would the rest of the herd take care of it? It's a tricky one, that. First of all, it would take a lot for a, a female to abandon her young in terms of elephants. We've seen some heartbreaking scenes. Fortunately, I've never had to witness this in person, but I have seen some documentaries on females whose calves have died in a drought or in a, in a time when there's very little food. And the, the females cannot be dragged away to the point that the herd will actually leave them to their baby and to mourn their babies. And it's very rare that an elephant cow will abandon her young. If she dies for some reason, unusual, but if she does die, yes, the, the herd will try to take care of the calf. However, 
They will not allosuckle. Lions will allosuckle, in other words, they will feed young that are not their own. So the baby elephant would have to be of the right age to actually survive that kind of experience. And most likely, unfortunately, an elephant calf that loses its mother, and it is under the age of about three, will probably perish in some way, whether it's through the actions of predators or abandonment by the herd eventually. And elephant herds are a utilitarian, utilitarian society, if I can describe it like that. It's about the good of the herd. And yes, that applies to an individual where possible, but an elephant herd will not sacrifice itself, a matriarch will not sacrifice the health of the herd in order to protect one individual or to wait constantly for one individual, which is why older elephants start to move off and away from the herd when they are getting to the point where they're reaching the end of their lives, and also why our, I think our snared trunk female, a character that we've become ex Oh, well, personally, I've become incredibly attached to in terms of elephants. That's why I think she's on her own with her little family. I think that she couldn't quite keep up with the feeding of the rest of the herd, and they slowly and gradually just kept leaving her on the outskirts until she just left. And then obviously mated with a, a male and had her series of calves. James thinks that the eldest calf, or the eldest female, in that little herd might not be her daughter, it could be a younger sister, that might be. The, the, the family, the close, close family bonds, the sisters and the mothers and the daughters, those bonds are incredibly strong in elephants, even to the point that they might split from the herd. Well, this is not the best view we've ever had of an elephant. <laughs> Just some movements in the trees. I, I kind of want to stay here and just settle, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a loop, look for that lion, and then come back and see if we can't get another glimpse of that calf. Now while we do that, Brent has found some interesting marks in the soil for you. So guys, this is not something we see very often. So we found tracks of the male cheetah. Unfortunately, they've gone into Kruger and here right in front of me we have tracks of a female cheetah now the reason I know it's a female cheetah rather than a male is cheetah have very big feet for a cat of their size but the male track is really big and it's, it's quite a bit wider and this is quite small and no and these are really fresh tracks so she sort of zigzags down the Kruger Park boundary here and she does cross into Kruger, but I'm hoping I missed tracks and it's not something I say very often. And she's ducked back in towards where we had that male line earlier. So we're gonna check this area quite extensively, but this is a beautiful, really fresh cheetah track. And we don't think we've ever seen a female cheetah, well not since I've been here, we've only ever seen the two males. So I'm really hoping we can find this lady. Now, jean Ray spotted something, just more of an interest thing in the middle of an elephant track. And, I don't know, can you see it nicely, jean -Dre? Yeah. So in the middle of this elephant track, it's a civet track. Now we've just looked at those cheetah tracks that are really, really fresh. This is a fresh track, but it's from the night. And from the dew this morning, there's a little bit of darkness on the edge where the, the water's collected and it was really misty this morning. So that's one of the ways we can tell the difference. So if we go back to that cheetah track, which I'm going to do now, you can see it's a little bit darker around the edges, especially there. So there's a little bit of dew collected. Now, if we go look back at this cheetah track, it's from much, much earlier. So within the last two hours, you can see there's no darkness on the edge. It's this perfect imprint and uh, fingers crossed we're going to find this female. It is, a, it is a long shot, I'm not going to lie, but we like a long shot. We're eternal optimists, so hopefully we're going to find a cheetah to add to that male line we've already seen this morning. Oh dear. Of course, me being me, I tend to destroy cables. 
put a cable near me. That's yeah, Andre's green. <laughs> I'm really good at destroying cables. I move around a bit too much. But unfortunately, I can't help that. Okay. Female cheetah, fingers crossed. So I would really like to hear from our long-time viewers, have we seen a female cheetah on uh, the live drives? If you have, or if you haven't, please let me know. And you can do that by using the email address, questions at wildearth.tv, or if you're technologically savvy, whack a hashtag in front of Safari Live and pop it on Twitter. So not only do I destroy cables, I also manage to move seats. So the cameraman insists on us sitting on a blanket so we hire so you can see us better. But of course, the amount I move in a vehicle, I manage to move everything, everywhere, spread out quite profusely. So I found che female cheetah tracks on this exact area before and I've never seen her. And chatting to the guides from Cheetah Plains, they have seen a female cheetah a few times, but she's quite skittish. So if we do see her, we're lucky enough to have the power zoom, so we're not gonna put too much pressure on her. I don't know, I'm just feeling really lucky this morning. I mean, we're looking at a giraffe and a male lion arrives, so why couldn't we expect a female cheetah? And who knows, maybe the ostrich is around as well. I've been down here a few times and I know Jamie seems to have all the ostrich luck. So the males crossed east into the Kruger, but they could definitely do a big loop back through to this massive open area, this little sodic site we're about to come onto. So it's always important when we come out into these open areas to check very carefully. The cheetah lie very flat in comparison to the other cats, but they often just crink their neck up. So the best way to describe it, if you see a cheetah at a distance, its head looks almost like a ball of elephant dung. And they've got very, very rounded heads. And that is to help with that incredible speed they have. They can run up to about 17 miles an hour, about 120 kilometers. And it is an absolutely amazing thing. So it's one of the reasons they're actually so endangered. They've become so over-specialized for that speed that any slight injury uh, will cause them not to be able to hunt and particularly with females it, it, it produces quite a difference. Yandere has just spotted something he wants to show you. It is a yellow-billed hornbill basking in the light and look at that. Even though he's just trying to get warm at the moment still watching the ground for any potential insects to eat. There we go, popped onto the ground. Did he see something or is he being wishful? Mm, I think he's being wishful. And you can see the preening there. Now, we see birds preening a lot and it's very important. Oh, onto the ground. Oh, has he spotted something? Oh, I think he's found some termites. Now, termites are eaten by almost everyone out here. Yeah? I've even seen leopards eat termites. Uh, but of course, generally only the alates or the flying ants, the, the, the future kings and queens of the termite world. But birds and other small mammals will eat even the workers and soldier termites. Tend to try to stay away from the soldier termites. So apart from the massive jaws that those soldiers have, quite a lot of them also have chemical defenses. Uh, they'll be able to, in some cases it's, it's formic acid, and I actually got bitten quite badly by a termite on bushwalk the other day. And uh, it actually drew blood from those teeth. I'm not going to show you where it drew blood because then I'd have to disrobe. And it's on my chest here. And now we're coming out to this open. So there's female cheetah tracks there. I'm hoping I missed the track and that cheetah's popped back onto this open area here. Now, of all the big cats, cheetahs have one of the most interesting breeding systems. Uh, in almost all animals, 
you need a female bias in, in, in terms of breeding. So you need few males and lots of ladies. Cheetah are one of the only animals out in the African bush that the opposite is true. You need a male bias with female cheetah. And this is another reason they're quite endangered. Okay. It's, 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 a, it's a real big problem. Uh, and people who've tried to breed them uh, in, in captivity will notice this. And it's very hard to get a female cheetah to breed. And in the wild, they will often ignore four or five sets of males before they're actually mate. So to get a successful breeding program with cheetah, you need a, a, a male bias. And it's the only animal that I can think of offhand our chair that needs a male bias. So to get a female cheetah to ovulate, she needs to be stimulated by multiple males. And with them being so endangered, it becomes a bit of a problem. But you often, you might often hear us talk about metapopulations. And metapopulation is sort of the wider, bigger population of a certain species uh, that holds the most genetic diversity. And when you think cheetah, you think Serengeti, Masai Mara. But believe it or not, the largest metapopulation that holds the greatest amount of genetic diversity in Africa is the Greater Kruger National Park or the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park. So this is 13 million acres of wilderness. Even though they don't sometimes have the numbers uh, of cheetah that you might find in Namibia or Botswana, it has the greatest genetic diversity. And that's what makes this uh, low fault cheetah population so important uh, as a whole for the species. But no cheetah, but we do have some striped donkeys. So let's get a bit closer to them. Now, I'm not saying there are no cheetah, we just haven't spotted any yet. And I'm looking under every bush and on these open plains, quite often a lot of the stumps have tend to give us a very cheetah-like appearance. And I've got very excited over a piece of a uh, piece of uh, leadwood or quarry a few times. So we're going to get up onto a slightly higher ground, and Jandre is going to show you the zebra. While well, he shows you the zebra, I'm going to be a little bit quiet because I'm actually going to take my binoculars out, and I'm going to look across this open plain to see if I can maybe spot a cheetah sleeping uh, under a bush or out in the open. Oh, and there's a gorgeous little foal as well. And look at that. Isn't that just gorgeous with that open area behind? Where did I put my binoculars now? That is the next question. So, as I was saying, I destroy cables. I also tend to spread out a bit. And I apologize for the noise. And while I make a horrific racket trying to find my binoculars, uh, Jamie has got the smallest member of the order carnivora to show you. I know where Brent's binoculars are. Brent's binoculars are sitting next to me in the car. <laughs> That's where Brent's binoculars are. Luckily for us, we don't need binoculars to have a look at our lovely group of dwarf mongoose. Dave, before we focus too much on our little dwarfies, they'll come back. Let's go up, up that branch, that one that goes straight vertical in the middle of your screen, and then in a little bit, to, a bit to the left. Where is it now? A little bit further to the left. There's a woodpecker. And I'm struggling to find it for you. I can see it from my perspective, but I think that Dave's angle is just slightly off from where I've parked him. But it is such a nice sighting. I'm actually going to reposition. And if I'm quiet for a moment, you can actually hear him. There he goes, a tap, tap, tapping away. Looks like a bearded through those leaves. Oh, sorry. Falling over in the car. Woodpeckers are amazing. Their tongues are wrapped around their brains. Now that sounds completely bizarre, but the base of the tongue stretches up around the brain case and then in and out of their mouth, which basically adds an extra layer of cushioning. 
and yeah, that combined with this incredibly rapid moving muscle that contracts every time they tap their head on something. And what it does is it pulls the brain away from the skull to minimize the impact that the constant hammering has. And what this woodpecker is doing, it's not trying to bore away a massive hole, but is tapping away to find hollows. And then in moments like this, where it's no longer tapping, it's actually wriggling its beak into wherever it's tapped out a hollow, kind of like an early stethoscope, the tapping that people, the doctors used to do on patients' abdomens and chests to get that echo. Once it's found a nice hollow patch, then it wheedles its beak and its incredibly long tongue into that cavity and fishes out whatever happens to be attempting to hide from it. And we've got a couple of different species, the bearded, the golden tail, the bennets, and there's one more that I've now com gone completely out of my head. Bearded, golden tail, bennets. Bear with me, it'll come back to me. I don't know why I'm having such a, a memory lapse at the moment. I think that we're currently looking at a bearded woodpecker. It's very difficult to see. Very clearly a woodpecker. And there's very, very tiny, subtle distinctions between the different species. I don't have my bird book with me, so I can't show you. I was busy checking something last night and forgot to put it back in my box. Black head. There's no red on the top of the head, which means it is not a male bearded, if it is a bearded. The woodpeckers are sexually dimorphic. So you can tell the difference between a male and a female just by looking. It, is a, it could be a female bearded with an all-black head. The females do have the dark colored heads without any red on the top. It's definitely not a Bennett's. It's too big to be a Bennett's woodpecker. And I don't think it's a golden... Oh, cardinal. There we go. I knew my memory would come back at some point. It's not a cardinal either. It might be a new bird for those of you who have only joined us in the last few weeks and have started up your bird list, as we encourage all of our viewers to do keep track of the different bird species. Some of our viewers are up to well into the 200s. I've been keeping a list of all of the different birds that you can see on the live safaris. Well, since our woodpecker hasn't been very obliging in terms of popping out, we're going to send you across from Juma right to the southeast of us on Cheetah Plains, where Brent has a stripy pony for you. So we've been checking the plains and I'm afraid all we could find was the zebra and Gnormulus gnormin. And we'll show you Gnormulus shortly. But unfortunately no spotted cats out in the open plain. We're just waiting to show you the absolute cuteness overload that is a little baby zebra. You can see quite a bit fluffier. Oh, it's just staying behind the adults. Of course he's staying behind the adults. So while we wait for that little zebra to pop out, Gnormalus was boing, boing, is the best way to do a wildebeest call. And he's on his way back from Mala Mala. There's Gnormalus Gnorman the Gnu and He's got some girls in, in tow today, off to the right there. But there's Gnorman, doing well for himself. And I know a lot of you will be happy. We, we spend a lot of time with Gnormless on his own, but he does have some ladies in tow this morning. Now, like Impala, they have a rutting season, and it's right at the end of the Wildebeest rut. So if Gnorman's been doing his job properly, Hopefully there's going to be quite a few mini Gnormans coming out of that particular group of females. Now I'm just going to try and get a bit closer to that baby zebra. And it is so wonderful to be out on these open plains, especially in the early morning. 
and I mean we saw that male lion just walk out of nowhere and I was hoping for a cheetah but you can't always get what you want uh, uh, but if you try real hard you can get what you need there we go managed to work a rolling stones quote into the morning drive and there is the little fluff ball so as with a lot of young animals they're quite a bit more fluffy when they're little and just to give them that extra sort of layer of warmth oh he's got a very oh she's got a very distinct little beauty spot on her cheek now each individual zebra has its own unique set of stripes and no one zebra is the same although to us it's quite difficult to differentiate but if you're a zebra it's probably quite easy now these plain zebra quite often have a shadow stripe which is the sort of half stripe on this on the back now we've got a very pregnant female who's being at the back of this herd if we come out a bit you know, to the left who's got a lot of shadow stripe you can see she's much darker and her shadow stripes are far more pronounced and you can definitely see she's not just fat from being a hind gut fermenter she's carrying a baby Now, I always love looking at zebra rumps and you can always tell who's a survivor. So quite often, not quite often, but occasionally we, we're lucky enough to come across a zebra who's escaped a lion attack. And um, when you see those stripes on the rump, um, oh, um, there we go. So if there's a lion claw that's cut through them, they don't match anymore. So they're actually slightly off center is the skin is healed in a different way and there we go you can see that really rotund belly of that pregnant female and she's dragging her feet a little bit i wouldn't be surprised if she popped in the next week or so so zebra unlike wildebeest and impala do not have a set breeding season and they will give birth throughout the year Now, we're going to let the zebra move on and you can see there's a little cape turtle dove and she's going about to pop up on her left scurrying around in the grass after grass seeds we're going to go do one last check past the cheetah plains pan and see if anything's coming for a morning drink and then after that we're going to start making our way back towards the juma and see if we can add a leopard to our cat count for the day I think the cheetah unfortunately have decided to, to go visit uh, the Kruger National Park and uh, hopefully they might be back on the sunset safari. So we're going to go see if we can add the other spotted big cat to our list for the day. I've heard there are some tracks around the eastern boundary so that works out perfectly for us because as we move from Cheetah Plains the first spot we arrive in Juma is our eastern boundary. Okay, so Pan is just up ahead, so let's go see if anything's made its way there for a drink. I wonder if Gnormus Gnorman, the Gnu's arch nemesis, normal Norman who lives on the next open patch will be around although because the male lion walked through there earlier I think he might be making himself a bit scarce today so we're going to have a quick squiz at the pan and if there's nothing there uh, we're going to send you across to Jamie we're approaching there's some impala but we're just going to scoot past them for now see them there on my right a little bachelor group of impala all the boys with no girlfriends and it looks like there is apps 
absolutely not a living soul at the Cheetah Plains Pan. We're going to have one quick look over the open area as we pop up. Breath held. jean I still thinks we're going to see a cheetah attached to a wildebeest. I'm not so certain. We might have to get the bendy stick out again. But nothing there. So Jamie has got one of the most delectable and fluffy creatures out here. So let's go have a look at what it is. Well, Brent continues his hopeful choice of um, chase of that female cheetah. We at least have got this extraordinary view of a male waterbuck that has apparently turned into a statue, it is so still. He has not, apart from the odd ear twitch, he has not moved since we stopped to look at him. I think he thinks he's invisible, but if he stays still enough, we haven't seen him, which of course is blatantly not the case. He's trying to sum up exactly what our intentions are. We're not displaying any predatory behavior. We're not comfortable coming any closer. So he finds himself frozen in a moment of indecision. Still a young waterbuck bull, despite his size. I mean, he's going to be a very big boy. But his horns haven't yet fully reached that upward-facing curve that they will when he is fully grown. He's just at that point, a young waterbuck bull in his prime. And you can see why this was chosen as the emblem of, emblem of the Sabi Sands. I often feel that waterbuck are an antelope that we sometimes take for granted. But they are one of the largest, and in fact, on Juma, they're probably the heaviest antelope that you will see. We might, if we get really lucky, encounter an elant, but it's highly, highly unlikely. Most of them are up right in the north of Kruger. And elant, of course, being the largest of the antelopes. The size and weight of a buffalo bull, except taller. And the waterbuck bull is second only to a kudu bull in terms of height. They are actually stockier antelopes, so they're a bit heavier. You're looking at a good 300, 400 pounds of antelope. And with their white faces and their shaggy fur, particularly striking. I'm trying to see if I can smell him, but the wind isn't quite blowing in the right direction for that. It's a very still morning compared to yesterday afternoon when the wind was gusting through here. still frozen. We're still playing musical statues here. Just that slight ear twitch. Did you know, just on the subject of those ears, that each and every antelope, when we watch them, those ears move independently, and it's almost an involuntary response from the antelope in response to any sounds that are around them, basically to make sure that no predator sneaks up on them. Now, how many of you can move your ears? I know I can't. I've always been slightly freaked out, to be honest, by people that can. Dave, can you move your ears? No, Dave can't move his ears either. It's, it's one of those rare genetic things, like rolling your tongue. Oh, there we go, we've got a little bit of movement. He's relaxed enough to start feeding. But that ability to move your ears independently is actually an evolutionary throwback to when we could move our ears backwards and forwards like the animals that we so often see on our safaris. It's a throwback, and that's why only a few people can do it. Evolutionary, uh, it, what would we call it, an, an abnormality in a way. Like some people have wisdom teeth and some people don't. We no longer really need them. <laughs> oh, my apologies. <laughs> Lou in final control <laughs> can twitch her ears. <laughs> Sorry, Lou. It still freaks me out, though. But <laughs> my apologies. I didn't mean, <laughs> didn't mean any offense to those of you out there that can move your ears. It's just because I can't. I'm just jealous. I can roll my tongue, though. So, 
There we go. <laughs> he, of course, the water bucket could not be any less concerned with his ability to move his ear. That right ear doing all the work this morning, double checking behind him, listening to any sounds while he ruminates. All right, boy, thank you. They've always got, it always fascinates me the white around their face and around their throat. Emphasizing those facial features. Beautiful. Thank you, Mr. Waterbuck. All right, well, we're going to continue on and see if we can't find that elephant calf once again for the last few moments of our sunrise safari. In the meantime, Brent has returned to one very flat cat. So we decided we'd give you one last visual of a very flat cat. Now, that male lion from when we left him, he literally walked 50 meters and plonked down on the northern side of our traverse. And there he is, flat and sleepy. And I think he's just enjoying the morning sun, as are we at the moment, thawing out from the cold morning we started out with. But a beautiful, beautiful winter's day. I think the high temperature today is probably going to be in the sort of mid to low 70s, about 25 degrees Celsius. And I know exactly what I'm going to do when I get back to camp, get myself a cup of coffee and go sit in the sun and, and bask like that male lion's doing. But before that, where there's still some animals to find, we heard some branches breaking up ahead. We are hoping there are some elephants around. Just try to grab something. A magpie a shrike. This one fly down to the ground. So they live in little flocks and they defend their territory quite heavily against other bird other birds of the same species. And you can see that quite vicious hook on the beak that they use to dismember their prey. Oh. oh, what have you seen there, Mr. Magpie? Look at that, it almost looks like, that's so interesting. You see how he flicked his wings open there? He was trying to incite an insect to fly, so trying to scare it, uh, so he could see where it is, and the movement would give away its position. Unfortunately, Either the insect wasn't there, or it was smarter than this magpie shrike. So unlucky for him, he's going to have to work a bit harder for his breakfast. Uh, back up to the perch, and he'll sit there and wait till he spots any movement. Uh, well, the magpie shrike searches for, searches for its breakfast. We're going to keep searching for those ellies we heard. Oh, no, he's back on the ground. He's got something, he's got something. Sorry, Jean-Dre. <laughs> he caught something. He dropped it now. What is he? He's got a beetle. Oh, I don't know if it... So quite often beetles have chemical defenses against birds. Yeah, no, that doesn't taste good. <laughs> so it looked like a little ground beetle. So they're able to spray formic acid, quite a few ground beetle species. So I think that magpie shrike has decided that was definitely not the tasty morsel it was looking for for breakfast. And it's back up to its perch. And uh, before it makes another mistake and gets another mouthful of acid, uh, let's go on to help the bird save for more embarrassment. And again, it's not always about the big hairies and scaries. It's such a fascinating small stuff that happens all around us. You've just got to take the time to look. So 
So it's been quite the eventful morning for us down here on the, the, the open plains. And uh, I still think my favorite moment is when I realized, oh, he's got something. Oh, he's flying away. Land, land where we can see you is a lilac breasted roller. Looks like he's got a large grasshopper in his mouth. Yeah, let's go forward a little bit. Do you see where he landed, John? Right? Can you see him? Ah, I got him right at the top. I'm gonna find you at the window. Flown again. Here we go. Oh, maybe we'll get him there. We got him. Oh dear. No, he's gone a bit too far, unfortunately, but we might get a little view from a bit further on. Yes, we will. Oh, no, he's flown again. Well, he doesn't want to be filmed. It's the, the world's first shy lilac breasted roller. Normally they like to be very gaudy and flash themselves for us. He has stopped at quite the distance though, uh, just to show you that we weren't fibbing. There he is on top of that marula tree. Whatever he was eating has been swallowed. And you can see the magnificent colors of the lilac breasted roller. Definitely not the best roller sighting we've had. Hopefully we'll manage to find one a bit closer to the road and we can have a look at those magnificent colours. Now let's see who's wide awake and listens to what nonsense we drone about on a daily basis. Uh, who can remember how many different colours there are on a lilac breasted roller? If you can remember please let me know. Send me an email to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. While we continue to maneuver around in the cheetah plains, Jamie has got the largest land mammal in the world to show you. It's okay, big girl. We do indeed have the largest mammal, and one more than entitled to the respect that they earn, which is why I was just having a quiet conversation with her. This female in front of us, her tail went a bit stiff as we approached. And a tail, an elephant's tail, of course, is a very, very clear indicator of their mood. But she's relaxed once again and is now feeding her tails perfectly still. Not completely still, though, because a still tail is also not a good indicator. But just gently waving about along with her ears. And everything in her body language tells us that she is relaxed once again. She's going to turn and face us and just have a wee look. No, maybe just shifting to get that mouth. This is the same herd with our beautiful little baby. Let me see, I'm not going to push to try and see if we can see it. We'll settle now for the view that we have of this young female. A oh, big girl. That doesn't look like a very comfortable mouthful of food. To each to their own. Don't know where that male's gone. I'm trying to work out exactly where he is. He's a couple of really old cows in this herd. You can't, from your angle, you can't see them at the moment. But they're moving through at the back. You can just see the, the bones of their skulls protruding. I love elephants just because there's such a sense, first of all, there's such a sense of peace. Oh, hello, little one. There's one there. <laughs> peace and intelligence. It's 
what comes with an elephant herd. And an, a sense of awe, a sense of awe that never really goes away. No matter how many times you see them, and it doesn't matter what kind of mood you're in, an elephant herd like this is guaranteed to make you feel better. A special girl. Hey, she's moved to a comfortable distance, which means that we can circumnavigate the buffalo thorn that they've casually pushed into our way, into the road. We'll <laughs> try and get around it. Oh, we're going to be so lucky. They're going to come onto quarantine. It's probably going to be at the end of the drive, at the end of the sunrise safari. But they are going to make their way towards the open area of quarantine. All right, big girl. Don't stress. You guys have just made life a bit difficult. Oh, made life very tricky here, elephants. We've got, let me duck my head just because those calves are going to disappear and they're currently being highly entertaining. <laughs> they had a quick fight over the branch. They're now trying, oh, oh, gotta watch your feet. Don't trip over sizing each other up. <laughs> so that old female, not all that interested. Oh, Debbie, you were wondering in terms of the teeth of an elephant, or in terms of the tusk of the elephant, are they like teeth in that they can get decay or abscesses? Yes, absolutely. Whether it's through a gene genetic kind of abnormality within the growth of the tusk, a kind of a weakness, some people have weaker teeth, some people have stronger teeth than others, um, or if it's through injury or something that they've done to the tusk, they can get a crack in the tooth and that can lead to very serious infection. And a lot of the grumpy elephants that have been encountered and that have been recorded in terms of their behavior, whether they've attacked people for apparently no, re no reason, have later been found to have had very uncomfortable tooth abscesses. And just imagine, those of you who have had toothache, you know just how that feels when that pain radiates up through your skull. Now imagine that you've got a, a set of incisors that stick out of your face, but obviously have very deep-seated roots inside. Um, that you cannot protect because now they're on the outside of your body. They keep getting bashed on trees and thorns and your head's pounding and your face hurts. Yes, elephants do get infected tusks and it must be excruciating, especially for the big males. And picture that tusker that Brent saw earlier. I mean, this little female has relatively tiny tusks, but Brent saw an enormous elephant yesterday on the sunset safari. Those tusks would easily weigh about my weight. Uh, you've got a good 100, 110 pounds hanging off your face that is now sore. Must be excruciating. And a very sad situation. The, the, the famous tusker in, in the Kruger National Park, Mfufunyan. Mfufunyan means the grumpy or the... What it? It's less grumpy. I'm trying to think of an exact definition for the word mfufunyan. Um, intolerant is maybe the best. And apparently he had, apart from the hole in his skull, where an elephant tusk had penetrated during a fight with another male, but he apparently also had a, a tusk abscess. And that was what made him mfufunyan. Also, knew an elephant called Kutide, or at least the daughter of an elephant called Kutile. Kutile means the angry one. I know many of you, of course, now think of Kutile the leopard. It's amazingly descriptive because it was an interesting choice of name. Because Kutile the leopard, when I knew her, and when I got to enjoy sightings with her, was never particularly unpleasant or grumpy. We have a question coming through from one of our newer viewers. We often refer to an elephant breeding herd. 
And Jamal, you were wondering about why it is we refer to them, what the kind of the difference is, what is the defining feature of a breeding herd. And while I answer you, I'm just going to reposition so we've got a slightly different view. You never know, we might see that little baby again. So a breeding herd of elephants is essentially a group of female and their offspring. That's all that there is to that description. Once a, a male elephant reaches sexual maturity, reaches puberty, he is pushed out of the elephant herd and sets off to make his way all on his own. Hi, big girl. It's okay. It's all right, big girl. <laughs> I think she was just walking around at the same time as I was driving around. Not too stressed out. So, a breeding herd, just quickly, is a collection of females and their young. A bachelor herd is a group of young males that have, or older males, that have left the herd. Occasionally, within a breeding herd, you will get one or two males that associate with it. They've joined up for a little bit of company and, of course, the prospect of mating. A buffalo breeding herd, on the other hand, will include several large males, okay. unlike an elephant breeding herd. Well, it has been another spectacular morning out here in the African bush. Really enjoyed finishing off with an elephant sighting. There's nothing more special than a peaceful herd of elephants all around you. Thank you to Dave for all of his fantastic camera work, as always, as well as to Rebecca and Lou in Final Control. Sorry, Lou. Uh, keep on wiggling those ears. And most importantly, thank you to all of you across the globe for sending through your questions and your comments. We will catch you later for the Sunset Safari. I'm going to say goodbye to you and to my elephant herd and head for home. In the meantime, Brent would also like to spend the last few moments with you and he's also got an elephant. So from one group of elephants to a single elephant bull. Nice big boy, probably just over 30 years old. And I think he's come in from the west, from uh, Kruger. He doesn't seem too relaxed around vehicles, so we've stopped a little bit further away and just letting him get used to us before we try to get a bit closer. But a lovely big boy. And you can see that white build up around their eyes from the dust at this time of the year. And the one thing I do love about elephant bulls is it always looks like they're never in a rush. Always got time on their, on, on the, on their feet, not on their hands, they don't have any of those. But they've always got time on their feet. Never look like they're in a rush to do anything. I can hear some more. I'm just going to scoot forward slightly. And remember, we were discussing a bit earlier, right at the beginning of the Sunrise Safari, always important to let your engine run for a few seconds before moving and always put the vehicle into low range. Now, this keeps the revs very low and very uniform. It looks a lot more relaxed than when we first arrived. Hello, mister. A very typical elephant bull behavior, the head shake. He's just reminding us that he's a big, strong animal and we shouldn't cause too much trouble with him. Hey, mister. Lovely, nice, even ivory. So Justin's wondering whether you can identify elephants from the wrinkles on its skin. Uh, Justin, I think you probably could, but I definitely wouldn't be able to. Uh, maybe, I think maybe some elephant researchers might use wrinkles, but run it through a computer program. Generally, the best way to identify elephants is to look at their trunks. I mean, not their trunks, their tusks and their ears. If there are any holes, rips, tears, folds are quite, uh, quite particular, but most elephants are ID'd by their tusks by researchers. Now he's popped his head into the bush, I'm just going to sneak another few meters and again let the car run for a few seconds before you move and then low range, I'm not even touching the car, I can just idle forward at a very sort of slow steady speed. And these principles work with all unrelaxed animals. And also, you never try to drive directly at an animal. Always try to use an oblique angle. You drive away, so you give the perception of creating distance. 
someone who was very unrelaxed when we first arrived is now letting us get quite close to him, we're probably about 10 meters or so. Hello, mister. You can see those big ears already flapping as the day warms up, turning on the AC, so to speak. It's a very nice, even ivory. We can see that he's left tusked. So the right tusk, very fine and long, the left tusk, Bit shorter and a bit more blunt. Uh, that's the tusk he uses to debark trees, and it's also actually quite a bit thicker. Isn't that interesting? But at the moment, he's not eating anything too big. He's munching down on a little zebra wood, and all he needs is his trunk for that. Now, to give you an idea how thick an elephant's skin is, it can be up to sort of four inches thick in places. And a zebra wood is what we call a flat tire tree. It's got incredibly hard wood and big spines. They're not thorns as such, but spines. And that will go through a 16-ply tire. And there we've got this elephant gripping it and ripping it. And that those spines don't even penetrate the skin at all. And the inside of his mouth is like an tough old leather boot because not only is, oh, he's now chewing those spines and it doesn't get any cuts or anything inside his mouth so very very interesting how different animals have adapted different toughness in their mouth i'd say out of all the animals we've probably got one of the softest mouths and it tears and cuts very easily even the other primates uh, like baboons and monkeys we get here are capable of eating much harder and tougher things than we are. Now, isn't this incredible? So when we first arrived, he wasn't too happy with our presence, but because we took our time and we stopped a little bit further away and moved forward in increments, he's now letting us sit right opposite him and he's not even showing any notice of us as he demolishes that zebra wood. And there we saw him use that left tusk. So he put the branch over the left tusk, used his trunk to break it. And so he's definitely showing us why he's a left-handed or left-tusked elephant. Moving on to the next bush, I think he's done with the zebra wood. What's next? Looks like he's sniffing for something on the ground there. What have you found there, mister? Ah, he found a little creeper. I didn't, unfortunately, get to see what it was before he, 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 he ate it, but he's moved on now to the next little zebra wood. And isn't this a wonderful way to end the sunrise safari with a nice big adult elephant bull here on Cheetah Plains doing some gardening. Uh, from Jandre and myself, it's been splendid to have you on the back with us. And don't forget, it's only a few short hours till the sun sets safari. And enough of my gabbing for the last couple of seconds of drive. I know you would much rather look at this gentle giant. So toodles till just now.